This lecture will cover part one of the chapter on evolution from chapter 22, Descent with Modification. Now before we get started, I want to point out that no matter what your beliefs as a scientist, anything that you do at home or believe outside of the laboratory, all scientists approach evolution and any other field with methodolo methodological naturalism. So what that means is your methods that you use in a lab assume that all things have a natural cause. So no matter what, the hypotheses that you propose and the explanations that you accept always assume that all processes have natural phenomena behind them. So no supernatural uh, causes. And this is really important because this is the only way to make scientific progress. There's no other way to know when to give up. So let's say there is a supernatural process out there. Well, we don't have any way to measure that or to know about it. So if we, let's just say on day one, we say, wow, so, somebody's sick. Well, must be Zeus that made them sick. I give up and you walk out of the room, <laughs> you know? Well, that's, that's great, but you could have cured them if you pursued it further. There's no way to know when to give up on an explanation and say that it's due to supernatural causes. So you pursue everything all the way to the end as if there is a natural explanation for it. Now, jumping into life, if we recall from Bio 1, we know that life is diverse and yet life is unified. So we have millions of species. Each species has traits that allow them to live in their environment, but all organisms have certain traits in common, such as DNA, uh, RNA, things like that. And that gets us then to the idea of evolution. And evolution can be divided up into two pieces. The fact of evolution and the theory of evolution. The fact of evolution is that we know organisms change over time, adapt, new species arise. And we can see this in the pattern of evolution, the pattern of life on Earth and the pattern of the fossil record. The theory of evolution explains how things change, or the mechanism of change. So natural selection in this case, how organisms change and adapt over time. That's known as the process of evolution. So we know evolution is a fact due to the pattern. The theory is the explanation of how it happens, which is the process, an explanation of the mechanisms that drive evolution. And if we look all the way back to Aristotle in 322 BCE, before the Common Era, he had this thing called the scale naturae, and he thought that all life was organized in a hierarchy by the gods, right? And everything was, was uh, unchanging, everything formed this hierarchy with humans at the top and, and, and gods above humans, and at the bottom might be plants and things like that. Um, and life was, was supposedly perfect, and it was permanent, so things would not go extinct, new things would not arise. And then later on, Carl Linnaeus pops up and starts to name things and categorize things in his own system. And we'll talk more about Linnaeus as the semester rolls on. But one thing I want to point out is that the, the common idea of this simple progression, like on the left, from you know some sort of monkey to humans, is not the way that evolution actually works. We, have, we know the pattern of evolution is not a simple linear you know, change over time. It's more like a branching tree. And ans you know, ancestral groups often live alongside the more uh, recently arrived groups. So just because one group you know, gives rise to a new species does not necessarily mean the original group goes extinct. So if you look on the right, evolution is more like this, a branching tree where we have ancestors giving rise to different groups, a lot of them go extinct. Human beings, for example, had a cousin group called the Neanderthals. So Homo sapiens had a, a uh, what we would call a sister group, the Neanderthals, that we lived alongside for a long time uh, before they ended up going extinct. But humans are the only group out of this branching system that survives to the common era. Now, if we look at how this theory was concocted, if we look first, it starts with geology, the study of the earth study of the rocks. And George Cuvier had this idea of catastrophism. 
this idea that the rocks were formed in much like a, uh, you might think of as a biblical fashion. So um, there were there were massive earthquakes and floods, and that's how the rocks came to be, and that's why they look the way they do. But later, Lyle and Hutton came up with this idea of uniformitarianism, which is that things don't form generally in massive cataclysms. Things in the geologic record form slowly over time, and those same processes that are happening now are the same basic processes that happened in the past. So we know that mountains get taller by like, you know, a fingernail thickness a year in some places. The, the, uh, the continental plates drift apart very slowly. Things like this can be measured and can be seen happening, but vast amounts of time are necessary uh, for those processes to uh, result in the Earth that we have today. So that means the Earth must be much older than was originally thought in the 1800s. So at the time, people thought the Earth was about 6,000 years old, but that's impossible, basically, based on the Earth we live on. We know that's not the case. It's much older than that. And that then gave room for scientists to start thinking about how life could have changed over eons of time. People knew that life probably changed for quite a while, but it wasn't until Lamarck that we had a really good explanation as to how it might change. So Lamarck came up with this idea. He saw the pattern of evolution, and he proposed a hypothesis to explain the pattern. Um, he, so his process, the way he explained the process, uh, ended up being incorrect. His idea was that organisms could use or disuse parts, and that would cause them to pass on the parts that worked to the next generation. They called this the, the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So a giraffe um, trying to stretch its neck to eat leaves would use its neck to stretch to eat leaves, and therefore it would pass on a longer neck to its offspring. That was his basic idea. Now, he had no idea on how things like um, genetics worked. It wasn't until Gregor Mendel came along that we started to figure that out. So in this example, you know, if we have a bonsai tree and you trim it and you trim it and you prune it and you prune it and you keep it small, then you would hypothesize, if Lamarck is right, that that bonsai tree would make seeds that would grow into other little trees. But that's not the case. You take a bonsai tree seed, you plant it in the ground, and you don't prune it, you'll get a great big tree out of that seed. So acquired characteristics, while it was a a good idea for the information that we had at the time, it doesn't actually work when you test it. So lots of things led up to this uh, idea of evolution by natural selection, uh, how we discovered it. So we had the information on gradualism appear in the 1700s. We had a guy named Thomas Malthus publish an essay on population. Um, basically it was an essay saying that uh, if we weren't careful, more humans would be born than we could feed. And that led, Charles Darwin eventually read that book and, and also read about geology, and he put it all together and came up with the idea of natural selection. So when Charles Darwin's a teenager, or well, actually he's a little older than a teenager, probably in his early 20s, I'd have to do the math here. Um, he, so he basically went on what you might think of as a college internship, sailing around the world on the Beagle and collecting plants animals, fossils, things like that. He also um, then, then uh, coins this idea of natural selection, but he's too scared to publish it because it's such a major shift in, in thinking from a religious view of how wor the world works to a naturalistic way that the world works. So he originally wants to be a, a minister and a church, and he, and he wants to do these other things, and now he's calling into question uh, the, the way he was taught that the world worked. And at the same time, short, you know, he comes up with this idea early on, but around uh, the 1850s, um, another scientist named Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace um, does other studies and comes up with the same idea, the idea of natural selection. And he sends it to Darwin to see what Darwin thinks, and Darwin's like, oh, crap. If I want to have credit for what I've created, I have to let the world know what I think about how life works. And so Darwin and Wallace both publish their, their uh, findings at the same time, 
And Darwin, having come up with it first and being the older scientist, of course, gets the most credit. So Darwin sailed all around the world and found really interesting things that helped fuel this idea of evolution by natural selection. And of course, one of the most famous stops on his journey was the Galapagos Islands. So before Darwin, if we had a question like, why are there no snakes in Hawaii? Pre-Darwin explanations would be, well, the creator didn't put snakes on Hawaii. Even though there's plenty of habitat that would work great for snakes, Darwin didn't put, or Darwin, God didn't put any there, right? So species could be placed anywhere in many places at once. It could just be kind of a random scattering of species. Whatever the creator's will was is how organisms were spread about. After Darwin, we say, oh wait, snakes couldn't get to Hawaii. Species evolve and originate in a location, and they spread and change as they adapt to new areas, and Hawaii is a pretty new island way in the middle of the ocean, and snakes can't swim or fly that far. Snakes couldn't get to Hawaii, and they, they could not get there. So on, on uh, the uh, Galapagos Islands, Darwin saw that there were different finches, and we've all heard about the different finches on the Galapagos and the different islands had different habitats, and the finches had different beaks that allowed them to eat food on the different islands. He also knew that human beings could make new, what we might think of as new varieties or, or, or something close to new species. Um, for example, wild mustard has been bred to make all of these different vegetables. They're all technically from the same species, but through the process of artificial selection, that is human beings choosing what organisms breed, through this process of artificial selection, we've been able to make kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, broccoli and kohlrabi, all from the same plant. And he knew this was possible. He also knew you could breed other organisms, like wolves have been bred into dogs, and you get anything from chihuahuas to great, you know, great danes or whatever, all from the same origin. There's much diversity here. You get a lot of different varieties through breeding. So what if nature in some way could control breeding? Now obviously nature doesn't pick you breed with you and you breed with you or whatever, but it's more about who survives long enough to breed. Who can hide? Who can eat enough food? Who can, who can uh, you know, survive day to day long enough to survive to breed? And those that do will have offspring that that also probably have the ability to survive and, and breed in that same habitat. So what is natural selection? Natural selection in a nutshell is Darwin's explanation of how organisms change. And like I said, some organisms are born that have particular traits that allow them to survive better in a habitat, and they have more babies than those that don't have those traits. And over time, those traits accumulate in the population. So Darwin's observations. Darwin made observations like organisms are uh, more are born than will survive, right? And he also observed that some that are born have traits that work in a particular environment and, and others do not, so they die out. So his inferences then, so this is an important idea in science. Observations are what you observe. Inferences are what you make of them. So when you write a lab report, students struggle the most with inferences. What are your conclusions? What can you say about science based on what you observe? So his inferences are, well, life evolves over time due to a process that he coined the term natural selection for. So for example, let's look at his, inference, his observations and inferences. One of his observations, populations have variation. We now know that's due to genetics. Gregor Mendel helped us to, helped us to figure that out. In this group of ladybugs, there's lots of different color patterns, for example. There is variation in a population. That's an observation. That's fact, right? Another fact. More offspring are produced than survive. Anytime you see a nest of birds, you can assume that most of them will not live to be adults. If you kick a puffball mushroom, millions of spores pour out, but only a few grow up to be an adult puffball mushroom. Think of turtles hatching on a beach, so like tortoises, rushing to the water. Only a few of those live to adulthood. Why do some of them make it? Well, part of it's luck, of course, chance. The other part is some of them are faster, some of them are better at capturing food, some of them have better camouflage, some of them are healthier, and that gives them the advantage 
and they survive to pass on those traits. Then we have the inferences based on those obs observations. So in this case, if you have some living and some dying, and the ones that live are the ones that are able to survive in that particular habitat, that would lead to adaptation of the population to the environment, like the camouflage pattern seen in these mantids. So the observations, individuals in a population vary. Organisms produce more offspring than the environment can support. And then what would happen because of that? What is that? What would happen if those two observations are made? Well, I guess then individuals that are well suited would leave more offspring than other individuals. And over time, the favorable traits would accumulate in the population. That is how evolution works. So this comes down to that idea of a scientific theory. A theory is a well-established and tested explanation for a natural phenomenon. So, from a theory, we can make very specific hypotheses. So, so a theory is not super narrow. It's not like, I have a theory that finches evolve. No, it's I have a theory that life in general evolves, and this is how it works. There are more born than survive. There is variation. Organisms leave... Uh, that are adapted have more offspring than those that are not well adapted and over time the population of evolves, right? And so it's a very broad idea and from that very broad idea, idea um, a use, uh, 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 predictions can be made, very specific predictions that you can use to test that theory. So you go from the broad to the narrow, the broad being organisms are more born than survive, etc. Then you make predictions like, I predict that the fossil record will reflect this change, and then you look for those patterns. Or you predict that organisms will change in a drought. A population will change over time if a drought occurs, and then you look to see if you can find that. So the Earth is six billion years old. Six billion, right? Um, it's hard to set up an experiment and test things that far into the past and that far, and, you know, and, and way out into the future and control for all the poss possible variables, but we, we do the best we can, and evolution is backed up by tons of science and tons of fields. It's, it's a fact. It is not just some crazy idea. It is absolute measurable fact at this point. So evolution is a contingency game. As the, That's one thing that people struggle to understand. Um, if you are well adapted to an environment, and that environment changes, well, now that's a new change of variables. Uh, you may not be adapted to that environment any longer. Perhaps you have enough diversity to change, but likely your, your species may well go extinct. So lots of things to keep in mind here, but first of all, just keep in mind that evolution uh, works through the processes that Darwin discovered, um, that organisms vary in their traits and more are born than will survive till adulthood. And those that are able to have lots of babies leave more offspring, of course, than those that don't have very many babies. And so that population adapts over time. And so that leads us to the, to the uh, idea of if evolution is happening, we should be able to see evidence for it. So that's when we look for the pattern of evolution. And one thing we might predict then is that closely related organisms will be similar both physically and genetically. So if they're just created by a creator, they may be vastly different. Um, we don't know, right, exactly. But if they are evolved, then we know exactly what to look for to see if we see that pattern. And we also can predict that there will be transitional forms in the fossil record. Um, this is something that's often very misunderstood by the general public, but we do find them all the time. They're they're all over the place. It's not something that we have never found, like some people will try to tell you. Um, and another thing that we have to keep in mind is that distantly related organisms may develop similar traits, traits if they adapt to similar habitats, and that can lead to confusion about who is actually related to whom. So you have to keep in mind that it's complex. It's not a simple uh, thing to study. So we will look more at these different um, patterns, uh, these, different, these different actual measurable aspects of evolution in the next lecture.